Moby Dick, chapters fifty five to fifty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters fifty five to fifty eight. Chapter fifty five of the monstrous pictures of whales. I shall ere long paint to you, as well as one can without canvas, something like the true form of the whale as he actually appears to the eye of the whaleman, when in his own absolute body the whale is moored alongside the whale-ship, so that he can be fairly stepped upon there. It may be worth while, therefore, previously to advert to those curious imaginary portraits of him which, even down to the present day, confidently challenge the faith of the landsman. It is time to set the world right in this matter, by proving such pictures of the whale all wrong. It may be that the primal source of all those pictorial delusions will be found among the oldest Hindu, Egyptian, and Grecian sculptures, for ever since those inventive but unscrupulous times when, on the marble panellings of temples, the pedestals of statues, and on shields, medallions, cups, and coins, the dolphin was drawn in scales of chain armour like Saladin's, and a helmeted head like St. George's, ever since then has something of the same sort of license prevailed, not only in most popular pictures of the whale, but in many scientific presentations of him. Now, by all odds, the most ancient extant portrait, anyways purporting to be the whale's, is to be found in the famous cavern pagoda of Elephanta in India. The Brahmins maintain that in the almost endless sculptures of that immemorial pagoda, all the trades and pursuits, every conceivable avocation of man, were prefigured ages before any of them actually came into being. No wonder, then, that in some sort our noble profession of whaling should have been there shadowed forth. The Hindu whale referred to occurs in a separate department of the wall, depicting the incarnation of Vishnu in the form of Leviathan, learnedly known as the Matse Avatar. But, though this sculpture is half man and half whale, so as only to give the tail of the latter, yet that small section of him is all wrong. It looks more like the tapering tail of an anaconda than the broad palms of the true whale's majestic flukes. But go to the old galleries, and look now at a great Christian painter's portrait of this fish, for he succeeds no better than the antediluvian Hindu. It is Guido's picture of Persis rescuing Andromeda from the sea monster or whale. Where did Guido get the model of such a strange creature as that? Nor does Hogarth, in painting the same scene in his own Persis Descending, make out one whit better. The huge corpulence of that Hogarthian monster undulates on the surface, scarcely drawing one inch of water. It has a sort of howda on its back, and its distended, tusked mouth into which the billows are rolling might be taken for the traitor's gate leading from the Thames by water into the tower. Then there are the Prodromus whales of old Scotch Sibald, and Jonah's whale as depicted in the prints of old Bibles and the cuts of old primers. What shall be said of these? As for the bookbinder's whale, winding like a vine-stalk round the stock of a descending anchor, as stamped and gilded on the backs and title-pages of many books, both old and new, that is a very picturesque but purely fabulous creature, imitated, I take it, from like figures on antique vases. Though universally denominated a dolphin, I nevertheless call this bookbinder's fish an attempt at a whale, because it was so intended when the device was first introduced. It was introduced by an old Italian publisher somewhere about the fifteenth century, during the revival of learning, and in those days, and even down to a comparatively late period, dolphins were popularly supposed to be a species of the leviathan. 
In the vignettes and other embellishments of some ancient books, you will at times meet with very curious touches at the whale, where all manner of spouts, jets de eau, hot springs and cold, Saratoga and Baden-Baden, come bubbling up from his unexhausted brain. In the title page of the original edition of the Advancement of Learning, you will find some curious whales. But quitting all these unprofessional attempts, let us glance at those pictures of Leviathan purporting to be sober, scientific delineations by those who know. In old Harris's collection of voyages, there are some plates of whales extracted from a Dutch book of voyages, A.D. 1671, entitled, A Whaling Voyage to Spitsbergen in the Ship Jonas and the Whale, Peter Peterson of Friesland, Master. In one of those plates, the whales, like great rafts of logs, are represented lying among ice isles, with white bears running over their living backs. In another play, the prodigious blunder is made of representing the whale with perpendicular flukes. Then again, there is an imposing quarto, written by one Captain Colnett, a post-captain in the English Navy, entitled, A Voyage Round Cape Horn into the South Seas for the Purpose of Extending the Spermaceti Whale Fisheries. In this book is an outline purporting to be a, quote, picture of a physitor or spermaceti whale drawn by scale from one killed on the coast of Mexico, August 1793, and hoisted on deck. I doubt not the captain had this veracious picture taken for the benefit of his marines. To mention but one thing about it, let me say that it has an eye which, applied according to the accompanying scale to a full-grown sperm whale, would make the eye of that whale a bow window some five feet long. Ah, my gallant captain, why did you not give us Jonah looking out of that eye? Nor are the most conscientious compilations of natural history for the benefit of the young and tender, free from the same heinousness of mistake. Look at that popular work, Goldsmith's Animated Nature. In the abridged London edition of 1807, there are plates of an alleged whale and a narwhale. I do not wish to seem inelegant, but this unsightly whale looks much like an amputated sow, and as for the narwhale, one glimpse at it is enough to amaze one, that in this nineteenth century such a hippogriff could be palmed for genuine upon any intelligent public of schoolboys. Then again, in 1825, Bernard Germain, Count de la Cepede, a great naturalist, published a scientific, systematized whale-book, wherein are several pictures of the different species of the Leviathan. All these are not only incorrect, but the picture of the Mysticetus, or Greenland whale, that is to say the right whale, even Scoresby, a long-experienced man as touching that species, declares not to have its counterpart in nature. But placing of the cap-sheaf to all this blundering business was reserved for the scientific Frederick Cuvier, brother to the famous Baron. In 1836 he published A Natural History of Whales, in which he gives what he calls a picture of the sperm whale. Before showing that picture to any Nantucketer, you had best provide for your summary retreat from Nantucket. In a word, Frederick Cuvier's sperm whale is not a sperm whale, but a squash. Of course, he never had the benefit of a whaling voyage, such men seldom have, but whence he derived that picture, who can tell? Perhaps he got it, as his scientific predecessor in the same field, Desmarais, got one of his authentic abortions, that is, from a Chinese drawing. And what sort of lively lads with the pencil those Chinese are, many queer cups and saucers inform us. As for the sign-painters' whales seen in the streets hanging over the shops of oil-dealers, what shall be said of them? They are generally Richard the Third whales with dromedary humps, and very savage, breakfasting on three or four sailor tarts, that is, whale-boats full of mariners, their deformities floundering in seas of blood and blue paint. 
But these manifold mistakes in depicting the whale are not so very surprising after all. Consider, most of these scientific drawings have been taken from the stranded fish, and these are about as correct as a drawing of a wrecked ship with broken back would correctly represent the noble animal itself in all its undashed pride of hull and spars. Though elephants have stood for their full lengths, the living leviathan has never yet fairly floated himself for his portrait. The living whale, in all his full majesty and significance, is only to be seen at sea in unfathomable waters, and afloat the vast bulk of him is out of sight, like a launched line of battleship, and out of that element it is a thing eternally impossible for mortal man to hoist him bodily into the air, so as to preserve all his mighty swells and undulations. And, not to speak of the highly presumable difference of contour between a young sucking whale and a full-grown Platonian leviathan, yet even in the case of one of those young sucking whales hoisted to a ship's deck, such is then the outlandish, eel-like, limbered, varying shape of him, that his precise expression the devil himself could not catch. But it may be fancied that from the naked skeleton of the stranded whale, accurate hints may be derived touching his true form. Not at all. For it is one of the more curious things about this leviathan, that his skeleton gives very little idea of his general shape, though Jeremy Bentham's skeleton, which hangs for candelabra in the library of one of his executors, correctly conveys the idea of a burly-browed utilitarian old gentleman, with all Jeremy's other leading personal characteristics, yet nothing of this kind could be inferred from any leviathan's articulated bones. In fact, as the great hunter says, the mere skeleton of the whale bears the same relation to the fully invested and padded animal as the insect does to the chrysalis that so roundingly envelops it. This peculiarity is strikingly evinced in the head, as in some parts of this book will incidentally be shown. It is also very curiously displayed in the side fin, the bones of which almost exactly answer to the bones of the human hand, minus only the thumb. This fin has four regular bone fingers, the index, middle, ring, and little finger, but all these are permanently lodged in their fleshy covering, as the human fingers in an artificial covering. However recklessly the whale may sometimes serve us, said humorous Stubb one day, he can never be truly said to handle us without mittens. For all these reasons, then, any way you may look at it, you must needs conclude that the great leviathan is that one creature in the world which must remain unpainted to the last. True, one portrait may hit the mark much nearer than another, but none can hit it with any very considerable degree of exactness. So there is no earthly way of finding out precisely what the whale really looks like, and the only mode in which you can derive even a tolerable idea of his living contour is by going a-whaling yourself. But by so doing you run no small risk of being eternally stove and sunk by him. Wherefore it seems to me you had best not be too fastidious in your curiosity touching this leviathan. CHAPTER 56 of the less erroneous pictures of whales, and the true pictures of whaling scenes. In connection with the monstrous pictures of whales, I am strongly tempted here to enter upon those still more monstrous stories of them, which are to be found in certain books, both ancient and modern, especially in Pliny, Purchas, Hakluyt, Harris, Cuvier, etc. But I pass that matter by. I know of only four published outlines of the great sperm whale, Colnett's, Huggins's, Frederick Cuvier's, and Beale's. In the previous chapter, Colnett and Cuvier have been referred to. Huggins's is far better than theirs, but by great odds, Beale's is the best. All Beale's drawings of this whale are good, excepting the middle figure in the picture of three whales in various attitudes, capping his second chapter. 
His frontispiece, Boats Attacking Sperm Whales, though no doubt calculated to excite the civil skepticism of some parlor men, is admirably correct and lifelike in its general effect. Some of the sperm whale drawings in J. Ross Brown are pretty correct in contour, but they are wretchedly engraved. This is not his fault, though. Of the right whale, the best outline pictures are in Scoresby, but they are drawn on too small a scale to convey a desirable impression. He has but one picture of whaling scenes, and this is a sad deficiency, because it is by such pictures only, when at all well done, that you can derive anything like a truthful idea of the living whale as seen by his living hunters. But, taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found, are two large French engravings, well executed, and taken from paintings by one garnery. Respectively, they represent attacks on the sperm and right whale. In the first engraving, a noble sperm whale is depicted in full majesty of might, just risen beneath the boat from the profundities of the ocean, and bearing high in the air upon his back the terrific wreck of the stoven planks. The prow of the boat is partially unbroken, and is drawn just balancing upon the monster's spine, and standing in that prow, for that one single incomputable flash of time, you behold an oarsman, half shrouded by the incensed boiling spout of the whale, and in the act of leaping as if from a precipice. The action of the whole thing is wonderfully good and true. The half-emptied line-tub floats on the whitened sea, the wooden poles of the spilled harpoons obliquely bob in it, the heads of the swimming crew are scattered about the whale in contrasting expressions of affright, while in the black stormy distance the ship is bearing down upon the scene. Serious fault might be found with the anatomical details of this whale, but let that pass, since for the life of me I could not draw so good a one. In the second engraving, the boat is in the act of drawing alongside the barnacled flank of a large running right whale, that rolls his black weedy bulk in the sea like some mossy rock-slide from the Patagonian cliffs. His jets are erect, full, and black like soot, so that from so abounding a smoke in the chimney you would think that there must be a brave supper cooking in the great bowels below. Sea fowls are pecking at the small crabs, shellfish, and other sea candies and macaroni which the right whale sometimes carries on his pestilent back, and all the while the thick-lipped leviathan is rushing through the deep, leaving tons of tumultuous white curds in his wake, and causing the slight boat to rock in the swells like a skiff caught nigh the paddle-wheels of an ocean steamer. Thus the foreground is all raging commotion, but behind, in admirable artistic contrast, is the glassy level of a sea becalmed, the drooping unstarched sails of the powerless ship, and the inert mass of a dead whale, a conquered fortress with the flag of capture lazily hanging from the whale-pole inserted into his spout-hole. Who Garnery, the painter, is or was, I know not, but my life for it, he was either practically conversant with his subject, or else marvellously tutored by some experienced whaleman. The French are the lads for painting action. Go and gaze upon all the paintings of Europe, and where will you find such a gallery of living and breathing commotion on canvas, as in that triumphal hall at Versailles, where the beholder fights his way pell-mell through the consecutive great battles of France, where every sword seems a flash of the northern lights, and the successive armed kings and emperors dash by, like a charge of crowned centaurs. Not wholly unworthy of a place in that gallery are these sea-battle pieces of garnery. The natural aptitude of the French for seizing the picturesqueness of things seems to be peculiarly evinced in what paintings and engravings they have of their whaling scenes, with not one-tenth of England's experience in the fishery, and not the thousandth part of that of the Americans, 
they have nevertheless furnished both nations with the only finished sketches at all capable of conveying the real spirit of the whale hunt. For the most part, the English and American whale draftsmen seem entirely content with presenting the mechanical outline of things, such as the vacant profile of the whale, which, so far as picturesqueness of effect is concerned, is about tantamount to sketching the profile of a pyramid. Even Scoresby, the justly renowned right whaleman, after giving us a stiff, full length of the Greenland whale, and three or four delicate miniatures of narwhals and porpoises, treats us to a series of classical engravings of boat-hooks, chopping-knives, and grapnels, and, with the microscopic diligence of a Leeuwenhock, submits to the inspection of a shivering world ninety-six facsimiles of magnified arctic snow-crystals. I mean no disparagement to the excellent voyager. I honor him for a veteran. But in so important a matter, it was certainly an oversight not to have procured for every crystal a sworn affidavit taken before a Greenland justice of the peace. In addition to those fine engravings from Garnery, there are two other French engravings worthy of note, by someone who subscribes himself H. Duran. One of them, though not precisely adapted to our present purpose, nevertheless deserves mention on other accounts. It is a quiet noon scene among the isles of the Pacific. A French whaler anchored inshore in a calm, and lazily taking water on board, the loosened sails of the ship, and the long leaves of the palms in the background, both drooping together in the breezeless air. The effect is very fine, when considered with reference to its presenting the hardy fishermen under one of their few aspects of oriental repose. The other engraving is quite a different affair. The ship hove to on the open seas, and in the very heart of the leviathanic life, with a right whale alongside, the vessel, in the act of cutting in, hove over to the monster as if to a quay, and a boat, hurriedly pushing off from this scene of activity, is about giving chase to whales in the distance. The harpoons and lances lie leveled for use, three oarsmen are just setting the mast in its hole, while from a sudden roll of the sea the little craft stands half erect out of the water, like a rearing horse. From the ship, the smoke of the torments of the boiling whale is going up like the smoke over a village of smithies, and to windward a black cloud, rising up with earnest of squalls and rains, seems to quicken the activity of the excited seamen. CHAPTER 57 Of whales in paint, in teeth, in wood, in sheet-iron, in stone, in mountains, in stars. On Tower Hill, as you go down to the London docks, you may have seen a crippled beggar, or kedger, as the sailors say, holding a painted board before him, representing the tragic scene in which he lost his leg. There are three whales and three boats, and one of the boats, presumed to contain the missing leg in all its original integrity, is being crunched by the jaws of the foremost whale. Any time these ten years, they tell me, has that man held up that picture, and exhibited that stump to an incredulous world. But the time of his justification has now come. His three whales are as good whales as were ever published in Wapping, at any rate, and his stump as unquestionable a stump as any you will find in the western clearings. But, though forever mounted on that stump, never a stump speech does the poor whaleman make but with downcast eyes, stands ruefully contemplating his own amputation. Throughout the Pacific, and also in Nantucket and New Bedford and Sag Harbor, you will come across lively sketches of whales and whaling scenes, graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm whale teeth, or ladies' busks wrought out of the right whale bone, or other like scrimshander articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances they elaborately carve out of the rough material in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical-looking implements, specially intended for the scrimshandering business. 
but in general they toil with their jack-knives alone, and with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please, in the way of a mariner's fancy. Long exile from Christendom and civilization inevitably restores a man to that condition in which God placed him, i.e. what is called savagery. Your true whale-hunter is as much a savage as an Iroquois. I myself am a savage, owing no allegiance but to the king of the cannibals, and ready at any moment to rebel against him. Now one of the peculiar characteristics of the savage, in his domestic hours, is his wonderful patience of industry. An ancient Hawaiian war-club or spear-paddle, in its full multiplicity and elaboration of carving, is as great a trophy of human perseverance as a Latin lexicon. For with but a bit of broken sea-shell or a shark's tooth, that miraculous intricacy of wooden network has been achieved, and it has cost steady years of steady application. As with the Hawaiian savage, so with the whale-sailor savage. With the same marvellous patience, and with the same single shark's tooth of his one poor jackknife, he will carve you a bit of bone sculpture, not quite as workmanlike, but as close-packed in its maziness of design as the Greek savage Achilles' shield, and full of barbaric spirit and suggestiveness as the prince of that fine old Dutch savage Albrecht Dürer. Wooden whales, or whales cut in profile out of the small dark slabs of the noble South Sea warwood, are frequently met with in the forecastles of American whalers. Some of them are done with much accuracy. At some old gable-roofed country houses you will see brass whales, hung by the tail for knockers to the roadside door. When the porter is sleepy, the anvil-headed whale would be best. But these knocking whales are seldom remarkable as faithful essays. On the spires of some old-fashioned churches you will see sheet-iron whales, placed there for weathercocks, but they are so elevated, and besides that are to all intents and purposes so labelled with hands off, you cannot examine them closely enough to decide upon their merit. In bony, ribby regions of the earth, where at the base of high broken cliffs masses of rock lie strewn in fantastic groupings upon the plain, you will often discover images as of the petrified forms of the Leviathan partly merged in grass, which of a windy day breaks against them in a surf of green surges. Then again, in mountainous countries, where the traveller is continually girdled by amphitheatrical heights, here and there, from some lucky point of view, you will catch passing glimpses of the profiles of whales defined along the undulating ridges, but you must be a thorough whaleman to see these sights, and not only that, but if you wish to return to such a sight again, you must be sure and take the exact intersecting latitude and longitude of your first standpoint, else so chance-like are such observations of the hills, that your precise previous standpoint would require a laborious rediscovery, like the Saloma Islands, which still remain incognita, though once high-ruffed Medana trod them, and old Figuera chronicled them. Nor, when expandingly lifted by your subject, can you fail to trace out great whales in the starry heavens, and boats in pursuit of them, as when, long filled with thoughts of war, the eastern nations saw armies locked in battle among the clouds. Thus at the north have I chased Leviathan round and round the pole, with the revolutions of the bright points that first defined him to me. And, beneath the effulgent Antarctic skies, I have boarded the Argo Navis, and joined the chase against the starry Cetus, far beyond the utmost stretch of Hydrus and the flying fish. With a frigate's anchors for my bridle bits, and fasces of harpoons for spurs, would I could mount that whale, and leap the topmost skies, to see whether the fabled heavens, with all their countless tents, really lie encamped beyond my mortal sight. CHAPTER 58 Brit 
Steering north-eastward from the Crozettes, we fell in with vast meadows of Brit, the minute yellow substance upon which the right whale largely feeds. For leagues and leagues it undulated round us, so that we seemed to be sailing through boundless fields of ripe and golden wheat. On the second day numbers of right whales were seen, who, secure from the attack of a sperm whaler like the Pequod, with open jaws sluggishly swam through the Brit, which, adhering to the fringing fibres of that wondrous Venetian blind in their mouths, was in that manner separated from the water that escaped at the lip. As morning mowers, who side by side slowly and seethingly advance their scythes through the long wet grass of marshy meads, even so these monsters swam, making a strange grassy cutting sound, and leaving behind them endless swaths of blue upon the yellow sea. Footnote. That part of the sea known among whalemen as the Brazil Banks does not bear that name as the banks of Newfoundland do, because of their being shallows and soundings there, but because of this remarkable meadow-like appearance, caused by the vast drifts of Brit continually floating in those latitudes where the right whale is often chased. End of footnote. But it was only the sound they made as they parted the Brit, which at all reminded one of mowers, seen from the mastheads, especially when they paused and were stationary for a while, their vast black forms looked more like lifeless masses of rock than anything else, and, as in the great hunting countries of India, the stranger at a distance will sometimes pass on the plains recumbent elephants without knowing them to be such, taking them for bare, blackened elevations of the soil, even so, often, for him who, for the first time, beholds this species of leviathans on the sea. And even when recognized at last, their immense magnitude renders it very hard really to believe that such bulky masses of overgrowth can possibly be instinct in all parts with the same sort of life that lives in a dog or a horse. Indeed, in other respects, you can hardly regard any creatures of the deep with the same feelings that you do of those of the shore. For though some old naturalists have maintained that all creatures of the land are of their kind in the sea, and though taking a broad general view of the thing this may very well be, yet coming to specialties, where, for example, does the ocean furnish any fish that in disposition answers to the sagacious kindness of the dog? The accursed shark alone can in any generic respect be said to bear comparative analogy to him. But though to landsmen in general the native inhabitants of the seas have ever been regarded with emotions unspeakably unsocial and repelling, though we know the sea to be an everlasting terra incognita, so that Columbus sailed over numberless unknown worlds to discover his one superficial western one, though by vast odds the most terrific of all mortal disasters have immemorially and indiscriminately befallen tens and hundreds of thousands of those who have gone upon the waters, though but a moment's consideration will teach that, however baby man may brag of his science and skill, and however much, in a flattering future, that science and skill may augment, yet forever and forever, to the crack of doom, the sea will insult and murder him, and pulverize the stateliest, stiffest frigate he can make, nevertheless, by the continual repetition of these very impressions, man has lost that sense of the full awfulness of the sea which aboriginally belongs to it. The first boat we read of floated on an ocean that with Portuguese vengeance had whelmed a whole world without leaving so much as a widow, that same ocean rolls now, that same ocean destroyed the wrecked ships of last year. Yea, foolish mortals, Noah's flood is not yet subsided, two-thirds of the fair world it yet covers. Wherein differ the sea and the land, that a miracle upon one is not a miracle upon the other? 
preternatural terrors rested upon the Hebrews, when under the feet of Korah and his company the live ground opened and swallowed them up for ever. Yet not a modern sun ever sets, but in precisely the same manner the live sea swallows up ships and crews. But not only is the sea such a foe to man who is an alien to it, but it is also a fiend to its own offspring, worse than the Persian host who murdered his own guests, sparing not the creatures which itself hath spawned, like a savage tigress that tossing in the jungle overlays her own cubs, so the sea dashes even the mightiest whales against the rocks, and leaves them there side by side with the split wrecks of ships. No mercy, no power, but its own controls it. Panting and snorting like a mad battle steed that has lost its rider, the masterless ocean overruns the globe. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide under water, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land, and do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee. Push not off from that isle. Thou canst never return. End of chapters 55 to 58